Okay, so uh, very we're very pleased today uh, to have uh, Firalba Kakoni, who is going to speak uh, about some old and new spectral problems and inverse scattering. But before she starts, I want to say a few words about Firalba. Uh, she got her degree from uh, jointly from uh, University of Patras and uh, University of Tirana. And she was an Alexander von Humboldt scholar at the University of Stuttgart. And then she went to Delaware, where she was for quite a long time. And she's now a distinguished professor at Rutgers University in their mathematics department. Uh, she was uh, elected fellow of the M AMS uh, in 2019 and is a foreign member I think you're the only one I know who's a foreign member of the <laughs> Albanian <laughs> Academy of Sciences. <laughs> that's a good thing. That's a good thing if you come from a small country, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you're coming from a small <laughs> so, so with that, I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much for inviting me. This is a wonderful um, a series of seminars that sort of kept us alive um, professionally during this time. So I'm very pleased to join this seminar today. Uh, so um, I'll be talking about some uh, spectral problems that arise in inverse scattering theory. The actually ultimate uh, purpose of, 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 of what I'm going to talk today is uh, uh, to offer uh, an approach, an alternative approach to imaging for inverse scattering problems in, in homogeneous, for inhomogeneous media. Um, uh, to say it up front, uh, the imaging approach that uh, I'm going to propose uh, is not going to be the uh, standard reconstruction um, uh, of coefficients or uh, physical properties of the media, but rather I'm uh, proposing a, um, um, a target signature that uh, would, would, would uh, detect changes uh, in the media. So this could be an alternative to the uh, standard reconstruction procedure uh, for uh, some problems where all uh, the requirements that are needed for that uh, are met. Uh, which I'm going to explain what these requirements are. <clears throat> but on the way to kind of come up with a target signature, uh, I'm going to describe uh, some spectral problems that uh, arise uh, in the analysis of uh, a scattering operator that would be basically the imaging operator I'm going to use. Um, and, uh, and actually the uh, analysis of the spectral sets um, uh, uh, bring up some very interesting mathematical questions. <clears throat> okay, so uh, to, let me, uh, I'm going to explain my ideas uh, through the simplest possible scattering problem that I can think of for inhomogeneous media. However, I should say that uh, when it comes to practicality of these ideas, uh, it's in, uh, I mean, this becomes sort of irrelevant and attractive if uh, uh, one deals with more complicated, more complex uh, in, hom uh, in homogeneous media. But to explain the ideas, uh, I think uh, to avoid technicality and maintain the focus, uh, I'm going to consider this simple model. In particular, uh, the, the um, configuration is uh, one has a perturbation of background, which in this case, uh, again, for simplicity is considered to be homogeneous. Uh, and let me talk in terms of say acoustic scattering where uh, everything is in R3 here and the wave propagation in um, uh, frequency domain is governed by the Helmholtz equation. And uh, one has, um, perturbation of this background uh, in homogeneities, and one can have uh, uh, in homogeneities represented by multi-connected components, it doesn't matter. Um, and the refractive index uh, in, in these components is, uh, um, is given by this function n, which in general, uh, for uh, most uh, 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 things I'm going to consider here, it's simply an L infinity function and uh, a real part positive, the imaginary part uh, positive or, or zero. 
and uh, the uh, the support of these characterized by uh, by the support of n minus one. Okay, so the perturbation. Sometimes I'm going to refer to n minus one as the contrast. Of course, uh, so now the incident field satisfies a Helmholtz equation, the background media could be an entire solution of Helmholtz equation, uh, but it suffices for all the discussion here that uh, is a, a, a solution of Helmholtz equation um, in, in a region containing the perturbation. So basically exist outside the support of the perturbation. Um, uh, I'm going to take an example as a point source um, very soon for the incident field. Now, the total field satisfies this equation, and the scattered field is an outgoing, so satisfies the Zomerfeld radiation condition. Very standard classical um, scattering scattering problem. So I'm going to work a lot with a scattered field. So this uh, scattering problem for inhomogeneous uh, media uh, is can be written as actually a source problem where the source here on the right hand side involves the contrast and the incident field. So it is important to notice here that although the incident field uh, is a solution to the Helmholtz equation at, at least uh, in a region containing uh, the support of uh, inhomogeneities. However, the scattered field sees the incident field only uh, in the support of the inhomogeneity because one minus N uh, is supported in D. Okay, so from scattering theory, this it is well known that, uh, uh, that uh, this problem is well posed if the imaginary part of the wave number uh, K uh, is uh, uh, greater or, or less than zero. So actually uh, I should mention that the wave number is the scaled uh, frequency, the scaled by the sound speed in the background media. So you could think of K as a frequency for any purpose. Um, so uh, uh, for K equal to zero, it's actually uh, the, the, the physical uh, situation. However, for imaginary part of uh, K positive, uh, the Rayleigh lemma guarantees uniqueness and this problem is of Fred, Fred Holm nature, so, so it is well posed. So now example of incident field uh, are like a point sources and uh, uh, to introduce the idea of imaging operator or the scattering operator, I'm going to take this as an example of physical incident field. Uh, so here I have shown um, like the point source uh, incident field, the total field and the, in, the scatterer inhomogeneity, it's a toe inhomogeneity, it's a circular inhomogeneity, and here is a scattered field um, produced by this uh, point source <clears throat> uh, uh, due to this inhomoge circular inhomogeneity, okay, so this is basically the situation situation. So, so uh, I would like to emphasize from these slides, we remember that the scatter field uh, is an H2 solution to the source problem that involves the, uh, so, uh, the contrast as well as the restriction of incident field uh, in D and uh, it's well posed for K of uh, imaginary part greater or equal to uh, zero. So as I said, when it comes to applications of these ideas, um, uh, it, it, it makes sense actually for more complicated inhomogeneities because for this simple situation, one could use very well optimization method and reconstruct and has uh, been a vast literature uh, and with wonderful results to reconstruct the, um, this refractive index. However, if you have an isotropic media or more complicated structures, then uh, um, the uh, reconstructing might be more challenging uh, um, uh, issue. And the alternative Im imaging technique that I'm going to propose could probably be used in these uh, circumstances. So, so one could have in mind this uh, a model for the governing um, equation of waves in the inhomogeneous media. One can very well have electromagnetic, elastic interrogations, etc. Et <clears throat> okay, so a very simple configuration of the imaging. So basically, what uh, my goal is. Uh, so having uh, an array of receivers, point sources, and uh, transmitters, uh, and uh, uh, 
looking at some uh, region in the space, the probing region. So uh, uh, from the measurements uh, of the scattered field due to an array of uh, transmitters, I, I, uh, my goal is to detect, uh, to get some qualitative information, detect changes, maybe some numbers, but not really reconstruct everything in this gray region. Okay, so recover some information about the scattering media. Okay, I have actually put here the uh, latest edition of uh, Colton Cress, which contains uh, a lot uh, up to actually uh, 2019 uh, kind of classical theory of uh, developments in the classical theory of uh, inverse uh, scattering. <clears throat> okay, so, so uh, just let me review uh, what are the um, imaging <clears throat> methods that have been used. Okay, so in my, in my opinion, I group them in these four uh, main groups. Linearization, born approximation works when the physical um, re uh, requirements are met. Um, Nonlinear optimization is a most developed and developing um, uh, class of techniques uh, with wonderful uh, results um, being improved and so on. Typically, you can set up an optimization method with uh, little data, even with one measurements. Uh, uh, but, but uh, the, the whole thing is that you need, of course, some uh, good a priori information to avoid um, this local um, uh, minimum um, issues. And, and, and uh, uh, it, it requires a lot of com uh, computational power. However, actually very smart um, uh, a formulation of nonlinear optimizations actually have been proposed. So it's a, uh, it's a method of choice if you want to reconstruct the coefficients. Now there is this uh, um, um, emerging uh, techniques of data-driven models and have been here in this seminar, uh, uh, wonderful uh, presentations have been given uh, from various points of view of uh, data-driven models uh, and, and, and machine learning and so on. Uh, so, so I'm not going to get to this. Um, group of techniques. Uh, so uh, what I'm going to focus is a so-called qualitative methods. And these methods also are sort of late uh, commerce in inverse scattering uh, with linear sampling factorization and many other new developments and closure methods and so on, which actually up to recently have been focused in kind of uh, coming up with an indicator function of the support of inhomogeneities basically just recovering the boundary where the, the interface of the jump in the refractive index. Um, uh, 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 however, uh, recently uh, a new sort of uh, point of view, a uh, twist of this method has been proposed and in the same framework of uh, imaging uh, operator, one actually detect uh, uh, some features of, um, of the scattering by the unknown in homogeneity through some uh, spectral parameters. I'm going to be more specific soon. So now the idea is that to, to use uh, this qualitative method, not only to detect the support of inhomogeneity, but actually to uh, get some information about the material properties uh, of the scattering of the scattering media. So uh, uh, factorization, linear sampling uh, have been discussed in these two, two books for those who would like to actually get more information. So I'm not going, I'm not going to be interested in recovering the support of uh, perturbation of what I know. So what, what I know is a background that actually gives me the information about uh, the um, um, uh, probing sort of what I would expect if there was no perturbation. Uh, so if there is perturbation, then basically linear sampling or all this method detects the interface of this perturbation uh, 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 in comparison to what the healthy background would be, okay? So, but I'm not going to go in that direction. So what I'm going to do is that uh, my imaging uh, region is this gray region and maybe all kinds of perturbation inside. So I'm just going to monitor this green region for various changes uh, uh, inside and maybe make um, a knowledgeable sort of uh, understanding what kind of changes uh, could have happened, like changes in 
the anisotropic media or changes in the density of breakages, cracks, and so on, right? So this is basically the point of view. And, and, and this will be done uh, through uh, the so-called scattering operator. This is an unconventional way from the classical literature of uh, uh, defining the scattering operator, but it is basically uh, the superposition of the scattered field uh, due to a lot of uh, transmitters uh, in this surface. Um, and uh, 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 so the measurements measured again in the same in the same surface. So basically, it would be I call it scattering operator because you could think of it as the operator. Uh, so from uh, inside outside, right? So not the total field, but uh, the, what you send in and what comes out as the scatter the uh, the perturbation. The scattering operator sometimes is defined as uh, inside outside, and outside would be the total field. So incident field and the scattered field. So, so here, actually, this is nothing you'll see, but the superposition of, um, uh, uh, of the scattered field measure on sigma uh, due to the superposition of point sources. Anyway, so n is going to be in my hands. Uh, all I know is n. And I'm going to uh, analyze this operator and figure out how it connects with the inhomogeneous media and maybe figure out some target signature that I can actually measure uh, from the knowledge of this operator without involving any, any PDE. <clears throat> Well, I see someone has raised uh, a hand. Is it any question? Okay, I'll continue. Uh, Jen Liang, do you want to yes. say? Yes. Ask? Okay. How do you define the function G here? It's a summation. Well, G is a function on the uh, measurement surface sigma. Then how do you define G? Well, G, G, G is a kernel, so this is an operator. So this is you. Uh, this is an operator that maps. Uh, so G is not defined, right? So, uh, so basically, what I know is only US G. It's an L, simply an L two function defined on this surface, right? So, so N it's an operator. So if I have if I have the scattered field. Uh, for all x and y on sigma, uh, then actually uh, I can define this, this operator where uh, g is the kernel, right? So for specific choices of g, it will come up, uh, then I, uh, I can actually get, I can get those spectral parameters that I can uh, define from this operator. Right, but uh, G is not fixed. So, so this is an operator. I know that having a US, the scattered field, then I know you give me an L2 function, I know what the outcome is. So, okay. thanks. Okay, so the ideas very briefly uh, are applicable uh, to kind of monitoring complex structures, right? So, so for us, it was motivated uh, from the problem of detecting anisotropic changes in uh, very thin materials. I'll give the, uh, the uh, application at the very end. Uh, it's going to be a twist of the ideas that I'm going to spend uh, most of the time to explain. But anyway, so one can monitor even periodic media, um, with nanostructure, uh, basically you have a very complex structure and, um, and then you'd like to monitor changes. So this is the practical situation where you could use the methods that I'm going to explain. However, you will see that uh, all I'm going to explain is going to be uh, in the uh, context of, uh, of this model. Okay, so, but please keep in mind, so this model helps me to give, uh, to, 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 to present my ideas However, the uh, practical applicability of uh, these ideas is for much more complicated structures because at the end, when you apply this imaging method, you don't need actually to know, uh, you don't need to know the uh, PDE model governing. You should have an idea because you know the interrogation modality, but you don't need to have a precise uh, PDE model that governs the equation. You're simply monitoring changes. Anyway, so uh, I mean, to, to everyone, it's sort of, of uh, familiar the idea of uh, a nice, stable a target signature would be a spectral parameter uh, that comes uh, from that uh, scattering phenomena. OK, 
Okay, so uh, eigenvalues are nice, are uh, uh, numbers, and uh, uh, if you can measure them, um, uh, then you have these numbers in your hands, and if you understand how they are related to inhomogeneities, then, uh, then they could be a very nice stable target signature for changes in, in, in the inhomogeneity. So, so basically, uh, to see what kind of spectral problems I can use, um, spectral parameters I can use as target signature, I'm simply going to analyze this operator N, which uh, is defined uh, from my measurements. Uh, once I have multi-static, and that's why it's important for this idea to have an array of transmitters and receivers. So you have an operator, you know, like Dirichlet to Neumann operator, right? So, so here is this operator uh, that, um, uh, uh, that if uh, I analyze what the main properties of this operator are, then uh, you will see that uh, naturally uh, a, a various sets of um, spectral parameters uh, come into discussion. In particular, there will be three important spectral uh, sets. Uh, one, the famous um, classical um, scattering resonances or scattering poles that uh, have been a, a major part of understanding scattering phenomena. Uh, secondly, uh, non-scattering wave numbers and transmission eigenvalues. These are very closely related. Um, and uh, this is what I'm going to uh, describe so. So let me go back uh, to the, the model that uh, I, I um, introduced. So I have the scattering, uh, the scattered field governed by this. Again, um, the, uh, this equation sees the incident field only restricted in the support of inhomogeneity. So actually the operator, the scattering operator is well-defined uh, for a larger class of incident field, not necessarily uh, for physical incident field. So as long as I have uh, a solution, a, a distributional solution to Helmholtz equation uh, L2 uh, inside D, then I can make sense of this equation, then the scattered field is well defined. So this operator uh, is has a much larger range than my operator N that I can uh, obtain from the scattering measurements, okay? Uh, however, these operators is richer and then will bring out uh, a lot of uh, interesting spectral uh, sets that will be of my interest. But keep in mind for imaging, all I have in my hands is N. And N is simply the super the composition of this operator, solution operator G with uh, uh, the physical incident field, which uh, for the chosen G will be the superposition of point sources with sources in the, um, in the transmitter, uh, transmitter surface. Okay. All right, so now here, here comes the scattering poles. The scattering poles I'm going to introduce, uh, maybe it's not standard in terms of this operator G, but it's the same thing. So this operator G is well-defined for uh, wave numbers of imaginary part greater or equal to zero. Okay, so, uh, so this actually, uh, G, this operator G can be seen as uh, the uh, inverse of identity is uh, this Lippmann-Schwinger equation. So this uh, Lippmann-Schwinger, which is identity minus the Lippmann-Schwinger operator can have a kernel, the uniqueness is not defined, is not uh, determined for K of imaginary part less than zero. So the inverse is going to have poles at, the, uh, at, at, at those Ks for which there is no uniqueness. And due to the Fredholm property of the Lippmann-Schwinger equation, uh, you have that this actually uh, non-uniqueness can hold only at a discrete set. Okay, so, so these are the scattering poles. They are poles of meromorphic extension of the operator G. And they can be seen as the wave numbers where there is a no zero scattered field uh, due to zero incident field. So I put here this uh, book that it's a comprehensive discussion of uh, uh, resonances. The mathematical theory of scattering resonances, it's uh, really, really exciting and deep and has been developed for years and years. Uh, many people in this audience have worked in this area. I know Fadil, for example, has done a lot of work in using scattering resonances 
And uh, uh, so this is a, a set of uh, spectral parameters that come out of scattering theory. So, however, for my purpose of trying to get uh, information about the inhomogene inhomogeneous media, the scattering resonances, uh, due to the fact they are purely imaginary, it's kind of hard to, uh, to determine. Maybe only those that are near a real axis could be determined. Of course, uh, Fadil has done a lot of work in relating this uh, scattering resonances with the decay rate in the time, uh, in the time regime of scattered waves. And some work has been done on singularity expansion method and so on. Uh, but I'm not going to use uh, scattering uh, poles in my kind of imaging spectral set. Okay, but this is one set that actually I'm going to contrast them uh, against the new set of spectral parameters I'm going to introduce. So the other uh, two sets that I actually discussed at the beginning, kind of not discussed but mentioned, are the so-called transmission eigenvalues and non-scattering wave numbers. All right, so you have this operator that depends on G, okay? In an analytic has poles in the lower half plane. But you could say, what is the kernel of this operator? Is this operator injective, okay? It has poles for K of imaginary part less than zero, but how about injectivity? Uh, when this operator is, um, uh, is uh, not injective, what does it mean for this operator GK to be not injective? It means that uh, you can have an, a, a, a V, which is solution to this uh, Helmholtz equation uh, in D uh, that, um, that uh, produces scattered field that is uh, zero outside the inhomogeneity, okay? So uh, the, these are no scattering uh, wave numbers. So there is no zero scattered field uh, due to, uh, oh, sorry, there is a zero scattered field due to a non-zero incident field, okay? So, so now uh, these are scattering, uh, if you use non-scattering wave numbers, if you use actually physical incident field, because you send, you'd like to probe an inhomogeneity with incident field that are defined outside of the inhomogeneity. So these are not exactly case for which the kernel of this operator G is zero, right? So non-scattering wave numbers are not really transmission eigenvalues. Um, oh, sorry, uh, scatter, uh, uh, well, transmission eigenvalues are not going to be uh, non-scattering wave numbers. I just, at the, this point, I like to make the distinction between these two. Non-scattering wave numbers are the uh, values of K for which I can probe with one incident, uh, an incident field that doesn't scatter. Like here, for example, here is a superposition of point sources and I don't see this in homogeneity, no scattering back. Transmission eigenvalues will be uh, the values of K for which the kernel of this uh, operator is not empty. So the difference is going to become clearer uh, very soon. Okay, but let what people do when they try to understand this petrol set uh, in scattering theory, they try to separate variables. So when you separate variables, uh, then you get explicit expression for scattered field and, uh, and everything, okay? So when you separate variables, uh, then uh, if you take incident fields of this form that are superposition of so-called plane waves, you can think of incident field that I was taking if the point source is at infinity. So then you get this uh, scattered uh, field given by uh, by this expression outside the ball, right? And all these are kind of, I apologize for the dense uh, slide, but these are simply um, uh, uh, entire um, uh, functions of the wave number K, okay? So it's given by the determinant of this expression and this ex uh, W by the determinant of this expression. So here you see explicitly what the non-scattering wave numbers are and what the, uh, uh, um, uh, scattering poles are. Okay, so scattering poles, the zeros of this determinant. And you can do analysis, uh, a complex analysis on this uh, entire function. And you can see that the zeros of this W are simply of uh, with imaginary part uh, strictly negative. Whereas the non-scattering waves uh, number are the zeros of this C. 
So you do again, uh, it's actually the an an complex analysis on these entire functions is not trivial. Uh, it leads to a very beautiful mathematical question, but that's not my goal today. So, so you can see actually this C can have infinitely many real uh, zeros and infinitely many complex zeros. So there are, in this case, infinitely many non-scattering wave numbers. So if you probe a ball by this, okay, and then you are not going to see any, any scattering back. At, at the zeros of this C. So you can see this sort of duality between scattering poles and, uh, and uh, non-scattering wave numbers. So, however, um, we have actually analyzed this uh, duality uh, concept between non-scattering wave numbers and scattering pole, poles in a recent paper with David Colton and Hussam. I don't want to discuss into details these ideas, but actually uh, you can interchange the role of the poles and the kernel of the operator if you actually interchange sort of the role of the scattering problem as an exterior scattering problem. So you measure outside, you program outside, and with a scattering problem, an interior scattering problem, so you um, measure from uh, inside <clears throat> and send a waves from inside. Okay, so, but I'm going to leave this duality, so I'm going to move to transmission eigenvalues and non-scattering and see what the connection between them is. And this is going to be actually my spectral set of choice that uh, I would like to use in uh, my uh, imaging, uh, imaging uh, technique, <clears throat> imaging approach. Okay, so let me go back. So forget now about scattering poles. So let me go back to non-scattering wave numbers, okay? And, uh, and then transmission eigenvalues. So for a ball, I said that uh, as long as k is zero of this uh, entire function, then all those k's are going to be wave numbers for which I have an incident field V that produces no scattered field outside. So the scatter, the, the whole energy is inside the inhomogeneity, okay? Inside there is field there is this field U or US inside exist as a non-zero function, outside is zero. There is no scattering field outside, okay? So these were no scattering wave numbers. But then I can just pause for a second and see that, well, if K is such that, that this determinant is zero, Okay, actually carefully, if you look at these determinants, so these are the solutions of the equation inside the, uh, for inhomogeneity, these are the solutions restricted in D again solves the Helmholtz equation inside D. And uh, actually the determinant being zero means that the Cauchy data coincide on the boundary. So obviously uh, just staring at the, this expression, you realize that V and W and U are nothing but no zero solution to this homogeneous equation uh, system. So this is an eigenvalue problem in terms of K square, right? So in this case, okay, uh, one sees that all possible non-scattering wave numbers are indeed eigenvalues of this, uh, of this um, uh, eigenvalue problem, the transmission eigenvalue problem. You can go backwards if you have a non uh, an eigenvalue of this problem, then you can actually, by construction, V is going to have uh, this expression, so you have incident fields of special uh, form that do not scatter. So maybe I should emphasize at this point, when I say that K is a non-scattering wave number, it doesn't mean that it's like locking, that I send anything and I don't get any uh, scattered field back. So this is invisible frequency with respect to a particular choice of the incident field. So the definition is there exists an incident field that doesn't scatter. And of course the incident field is related to the inhomogeneity that uh, um, it doesn't scatter, okay? So, so for scattering media, for uh, spherically stratified media, symmetric media, I don't need to distinguish between non-scattering waves and transmission eigenvalues. So these are exactly the same. Okay, so you can see them as zeros, okay, that do not produce any scattered field back, or you can see them as uh, eigenvalues of this uh, uh, transmission eigenvalue problem. Now, how about in general? 
Well, in general, you say, well, can I send an incident field? Define incident field as you wish, but the whole thing is that the incident field is reachable by the observer. So the observer send the incident field uh, from outside. So it is defined as a solution to Helmholtz equation, at least uh, outside in a neighborhood of D. But in practice, almost everywhere, except for point sources or single layer potentials on a set of measure zero, maybe not. But so, okay, so this is so. Can I send an incident field such that I don't see anything, okay, scattered by the inhomogeneity? Well, if I do so, then I can realize that I look at the scattering problem. Remember, this was a scattering problem. Okay, for the incident field here would be UI. Then what I have, I have that uh, that in fact, okay, um, uh, if if K was such a non-scattering wave number, then V, uh, which is the incident field restricted in D, and the scattered field solve this. Uh, system. So the scattered field has the two Cauchy data zero, okay, satisfies the source problem with V being the restriction of the incident field, and uh, V also is a solution to the Helmholtz equation in D. Could, I could probably have said here the extra information that I have uh, for non-scattering wave numbers that is not in D, but it's outside. But I restricted it uh, purposely in D because this is nothing but the so-called transmission eigenvalue problem, which is actually broader than simply looking at non-scattering uh, frequencies. Because again, for the transmission eigenvalue problem, this V here is determined only in D, okay? Whereas for non-scattering frequencies, I need to have V existing outside. Okay, so what I came uh, up with here at this point is that being a transmission eigenvalue, it is a necessary condition for K to be a non-scattering uh, frequencies. A frequency and the converse it's a very deep a mathematical question that actually has led to interesting research in the in the past five years or so. Okay, so now if I look at this PDE, eigenvalue problem for PDE, and suppose I have a real uh, uh, frequency, and then I ask, is this frequency uh, a non-scattering frequency? Okay, so it's a transmission eigenvalue, but it, it is it a non-scattering frequency? Well, if so, then um, I should have this V that is determined by the transmission eigenvalue problem existing as a solution to Helmholtz equation outside, okay? So the question becomes now, having this uh, eigenfunction of the transmission eigenvalue problem defined in V, can we extend it outside D as a solution to the Helmholtz equation? If it's spherically symmetric, yes, actually, by construction, it is possible. And it seems that a spherically symmetric uh, configuration is unstable. There is a nice work by Fogelius and uh, uh, show, uh, they have shown that if you perturb a little bit the circle, then those waves, V incident waves, actually uh, uh, may not scatter um, uh, only at the finitely, possibly finitely many wave numbers, okay? Whereas for a circle, there are infinitely many of those, right? So now for corners has been a lot of research, beautiful research, uh, results, various approaches um, using CGO solutions or singularity analysis of the solution of PDEs to show that uh, and if the support contains a corner, it's not possible to extend uh, the, um, the uh, eigenfunction outside as a, as a solution to the Helmholtz equation. Okay, and for smooth boundaries, uh, nothing was known until recently. Um, actually, in the same uh, paper, Fogelius and Shaw showed that, uh, that uh, if, um, if uh, you have plane wave as incident fields, uh, then plane waves always scattered except for fine, at most finitely many wave numbers for, uh, from constant inhomogeneities. Recently, uh, Blast and, and Hong Yu Liu have shown that uh, 
even if it's analytic, but if it contains points of high curvature, uh, then incident, some incident fields that satisfy some requirement, uh, non-vanishing requirement, actually more than non-vanishing, some cannot be small near the curvature point, uh, they, they, they don't scatter, uh, they, uh, they always scatter. Okay, so you cannot extend the solution outside this high curvature point. So in this paper, we made uh, major progress uh, to say that, uh, that in fact, um, uh, almost all singularity is scattered. So what we actually approved and uh, was outside the context of, uh, of scattering in the sense that we look at the solution to this equation, uh, which is the equation that, um, that uh, describes a scattered field, right? So typically V, okay, if it comes from an incident field, this V here is very regular, okay? So then, then you look at this and the question is, does this uh, 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 equation has an H02 solution? So a compactly supported uh, distribution or solution, um, uh, in, I mean, support, compactly supported in D. Okay, so looking at uh, this, we figured out that actually people long ago, Caffarelli, Kinderlechner, and Nuremberg have had a lot of regularity results for free boundary because the Cauchy data here are zero. So this is like a free boundary. So at least the local part, actually this result is local. So if you have locally a free boundary, then actually one can show that uh, there is an interplay between regularity of N and V. But if N is analytic, uh, uh, then V is also analytic. And if the boundary is not locally analytic, so in a neighborhood of this point X0, then uh, you not, don't have non-scattering wave numbers. So you have the same type of result for less regularity N, and then you have the result along the line saying that if the boundary doesn't match, so to speak, the regularity of N, um, and uh, then, then it always scatters. So, so V in the scattering configuration is very regular because it exists outside. However, in this analysis, all we need is that this uh, source term to be regular enough up to the boundary, okay? So basically we showed that, uh, so provided that it's regular enough locally near a boundary point, okay, where the, um, uh, the, the index of refraction is regular, then the, 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 there are no scattering uh, in homo uh, wave numbers for that inhomogeneity, okay? So in fact, this result also provides uh, uh, unless the, uh, the incident field vanishes, okay? So there is a non-vanishing condition. So this also provides regularity results for the, uh, for the uh, transmission eigenfunction. Uh, so, so uh, basically, to finish here, uh, I'm saying that for very special inhomogeneities, we may have non-scattering wave numbers. Okay, then, uh, then I just told you that I'm going to use this particular wave numbers to get uh, some understanding of uh, inhomogeneous media. So the natural intuition is that you would like to use non-scattering wave numbers because somehow if you are able to get them from scattering data, somehow uh, you, you kind of uh, intuitively understand that they are related to the particular inhomogeneity that doesn't scatter this particular incident field, right? So, so, so it makes sense that they could provide information about the media and that they could be measured, right? Because it be, the inhomogeneity becomes invisible. Unfortunately, uh, they are very rare. So uh, the uh, non-scattering wave numbers do not really exist for most of inhomogeneities, as I said, for corners, for one thing, okay? However, the good thing is that this uh, uh, close connection of uh, transmission eigenvalues and non-scattering uh, frequencies actually provide a way to determine transmission eigenvalues, real transmission eigenvalues. So you don't need to determine the non-scattering wave number. And why is that? It is because at a transmission eigenvalue, you may not have full invisibility for that particular incident field, but you may have an incident field that produces arbitrarily small scattered field. And this is because the operator N that it's in my measure from measurements, I know, okay, is related uh, with the operator G, 
okay? This way, right? So transmission eigenvalues are where G is uh, non-injective, okay? Not N, because uh, the kernel must be of special form. But I can determine the case where G is not injective from N because I can approximate arbitrarily close any solution to the Helmholtz equation by the superposition of point sources, right? So this is actually uh, the key that gives me a way to determine transmission eigenvalues now, okay? And they may not be non-scattering wave numbers. And here it is, okay? So uh, it is easy to uh, look at <clears throat> ways to determine the uh, transmission eigenvalues. So you may, you may ask actually, why don't I look at the kernel of N? Remember the kernel of N, it's a, uh, N is a compact operator and it's really uh, no way you can actually determine the eigenvalues from, uh, from looking at the kernel of the operator N. But you can actually use the Fred Holm property of the transmission eigenvalue problem. And then uh, 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 there is a way to justify that K it's a transmission eigenvalue if and only if uh, this norm here uh, becomes unbounded if you choose uh, the point Z and the, the Z is where you put this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, artificial point source uh, that you like to look uh, for if it is in the range of n or not. Okay, so it's kind of hard to get the idea behind uh, behind this without giving more details. Uh, but uh, let me just say that this connection between visibility and almost invisibility makes it possible. And the uh, transmission eigenvalues are determined as peaks uh, where uh, this uh, function of K um, uh, becomes large, okay? In, in principle, it blows up at the transmission eigenvalues. So it is possible probably to determine eigenfunctions also because uh, this VG Z alpha approximate uh, the transmission part V of the transmission eigenfunction. This is a research that uh, uh, Hong Yu has um, taken on to try to understand uh, how to determine the eigenfunctions and what they can give, uh, what information they can give about the scattering media. Okay. However, to justify numeric uh, mathematically, it's much harder problem and is justifiable only under very uh, restrictive assumption on the inhomogeneity. So this is what comes uh, out if you try to determine transmission eigenvalues. Unfortunately, practically you can determine only low um, uh, frequency transmission eigenvalues, high frequency, they become very, uh, very dense, but basically uh, you can see those uh, transmission eigenvalues. And then the whole thing is that now you know that you can determine a few transmission eigenvalues. So how do they relate with the, trans uh, with the refractive index? And, um, and this is another line of research. So I guess I'm getting a little late. So how much time do I have, uh, Fadil? I think you can you can go for another seven minutes, okay. six, seven minutes. Okay, thank you. So, so, so basically now, uh, knowing that I can determine those real transmission eigenvalues, so now it goes to uh, uh, a spectral problem. How can re this real transmission eigenvalues relate to inhomogeneous media? All right, and uh, this is basically the research that has been taken uh, off uh, again for like the past 10 years to try to understand the spectral properties of this transmission eigenvalue problem, which is very interesting and challenging because it's a non self adjoined eigenvalue problem. There is a lot of uh, work being done, okay, uh, and people have. Um, studied various spectral properties of this problem. For the point of view of applications, I would be interested in do transmission, real transmission eigenvalues exist, okay? Non-scattering wave numbers are relatively rare, now, how about real transmission eigenvalues? This is again an open problem. So for people who are interested in spectral theory, there is a lot of thing to do, right? So because this problem is not self-adjoined, it's hard to show whether real transmission eigenvalues exist. The only result is actually dates back 10 years ago, where we proved that if, the, um, if N, uh, the contrast n minus one doesn't change sign. So it's either 
a positive uniformly in D or negative uniformly in D, we were able to show that there exist infinitely many real transmission eigenvalues. So open question, can you relax this assumption? People have studied spectral properties under this assumption being only holding only in a neighborhood of the boundary. Okay, can you can you you um, uh, assume only uh, the contrast one sign contrast on the boundary and prove that there exist real transmission eigenvalues? People have shown that there exist because they have shown a completeness of eigenfunctions, but no one knows actually whether they are real or all complex. So, so this is basically the state of the art in this um, direction. So, so now, uh, if you know uh, in this case that we prove that there are real transmission eigenvalues, you can actually uh, prove monotonicity result of these real transmission eigenvalues. And uh, therefore, you have a good understanding how, say, the first transmission eigenvalue relates uh, to the um, to the material properties of the of the scattering media. Okay, so this is basically what we have been doing uh, with using real transmission eigenvalues to uh, monitor changes in the uh, material properties in the media. And more interesting is if you use those for anisotropic media. And uh, here I have given you an old examples. So how to monitor changes in the anisotropic structure uh, of, of a media. Okay, so um, there are many other examples in the literature. As I said, Hong Yu, I, I, I think he spoke in this seminar, has used actually the behavior of transmission eigenfunction uh, to get information about the inhomogeneities. All right, so the whole thing, I don't have now a lot of time. I'm just going to throw out in two minutes uh, a whole a new idea, a twist of this kind of spectral parameters as target signature. So probably I didn't uh, spell it out, but um, uh, if the media is absorbing, which is actually most of the cases for uh, contemporary materials, then uh, all transmission eigenvalues are complex. So again, we run in the same issue as for the um, um, uh, uh, scattering poles, for example. So there are no real transmission eigenvalues. So now can you spin off this idea of a sort of invisibility or almost invisibility and maybe introduce a uh, new spectral uh, problems associated with uh, inhomogeneity in order to be able to uh, study or use these ideas for absorbing or dispersive media. Another thing, in order to determine transmission eigenvalues, you need multi-static uh, data at a range of frequencies. And this range of frequencies depend on inhomogeneity. Okay, so you would like actually to use uh, only for one frequency, the multi-static data set. So can you do this? And uh, in two minutes, I'm just going to explain the general idea and I don't have uh, time to uh, show uh, the example where we are applying for these screens, but, uh, but basically the idea is the following. So rem uh, remember, when you do the scattering experiment, you send the incident field and you measure, and what you measure is both what you send together with the scattered field. So it's a total field. So now this total field, you can split as you want, right? So you can throw part of the scattered field into the incident field. What does this mean? It means that you look at this inhomogeneity as probing uh, by, by a different incident field. All right, so this basically is you change in your mind artificially the background where you look, uh, where you see your inhomogeneity. Okay, so this is basically the whole thing. So what uh, this amounts to is the following. So you have the uh, physical uh, scattering operator from the measurement and what you do, you construct the scattering operator uh, due to some Artificial inhomogeneity, simple inhomogeneity that you can compute, okay, very easily pre-compute, in fact, and store it, right? And then, and then, uh, instead of looking at the kernel or invisibility for n, you look for invisibility at this uh, n, okay? And actually, you end up with spectral problems uh, 
uh, in terms of the parameter lambda now, right? So um, one possibility, and I'm going to finish, would be, for example, if the scattering, if the, 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 the artificial scattering problem would be like a impedance, okay, surrounding the inhomogeneity, and the uh, uh, parameter would be lambda. So you compute it for a range of lambda, and then you modify pre uh, process the scattering operator and look at the kernel of this uh, modified. And then you basically have the same theory as I explained for transmission eigenvalues, but lambda is an artificial parameter, could be complex. So you can determine those parameters and so on. So this leads to a whole new class of eigenvalue problems that you actually uh, can uh, cook up depending what kind of modification, computable modification of or pre-computable modification of the scattering operator, okay? And this has been a new, an, another a line of research that uh, people have used. Uh, so here are some literature and I don't want to, I don't have time now actually for the example, I'm sorry. Um, I uh, probably went slower than I, I, I had planned, but, uh, but the, now, I mean, to conclude, uh, basically, this an, uh, analysis of the scattering operator leads to uh, various properties, leads to various sets of special uh, uh, frequencies, wave numbers, and uh, you try to figure out if you can see them in the scattering operator and how, what do they say about the scattering uh, media. Okay, and what I said, transmission eigenvalues you can as long as real transmission eigenvalues exist. And uh, if real transmission eigenvalues do not exist, you actually can pre-modify, pre pre-compute, pre-process uh, the scattering operator and then actually bring up a new spectral sets associated with the inhomogeneity that you would like to monitor. And uh, thank you for so I'll stop here and I apologize for uh, being a little bit over time. No, no problem. Thank you so much for the very interesting talk. There's a lot to absorb here. I know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> are there any questions from the audience? And if so, just raise your hand and I will un unmute you. Ah, there's one from the panelist and that is from Eric. Eric, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, uh, uh, Fioralba, for your talk. It was very interesting. Um, I have a probably very naive question, but you mentioned the duality between uh, transmission eigenvalues and, and uh, scattering poles, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is there something that relates non-scattering non uh, frequency than in the dual picture? Uh, uh, yes, because, because, so you see, uh, if you look at, at the spherical stratified media, right? Um, so, uh, the, oh, where is this? Okay, here. The scattering poles are the zeros of this W, right? Okay. So, so this, these are, uh, so the, uh, the Ws involve, involve the uh, Henkel function, right? So outgoing. Uh, so the zero, I mean, you could, you could look at these Ws as, coming from uh, the non-scattering wave numbers, if the infinity, the incident field, a sort of, uh, it's some sort of point source send at the origin of the disk, right? And the scattering okay. problem is defined inside D. I see, okay. For general media, for general media, you have the same issue. So for general media, uh, what we did in this paper, so say you have the scattering problem I discussed for D, right? So then we introduced, so you send the point sources, right? On, on a, say a ball circumscribing D. So now we put, uh, we put a ball inside the homogeneity and then we send sources from inside, okay? And uh, the scattering now, uh, the scattering problem is a scattering problem defined inside D. Okay, and then uh, it's the same issue. You don't get full invisibility, but you again get uh, approximate invisibility, the same as you have between transmission eigenvalues and non-scattering frequencies for the exterior problem. All right. But okay. for the ball, it's exactly basically yeah, right. You, but you, you have right, yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. 
So the idea was not for the scattering pole, not so much to determine them because it's not clear what kind of experiment you could you could design to get this interior problem, right? But we are proposing it as probably a possibility, an alternative numerical uh, me, uh, approach to compute, for example, scattering poles. Or maybe another point of view to probably uh, uh, give uh, insight uh, into this scattering poles kind of theoretical. Okay. And we did it for the Dirichlet -like eigenvalues and a scattering poles also. There is this duality now if you have a, a, a Dirichlet obstacle. I see. Okay. Uh, there's a question from Jin Lam. Uh, yes. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Uh, wonderful talk. So. I have two questions here. First question is that um, uh, while counting theorem states that the uh, eigenvalues sort of asymptotically distributed according to the volume of the domain. So can we uh, use that uh, theorem to compute uh, like uh, uh, eigenvalues in the high frequency regime? Uh, you mean... Uh... Yeah, why or law? Okay. And which essentially are related to the uh, number of eigenvalues uh, to the volume of uh, the domain. Uh, right, but you get other uh, eigenvalues. I don't. I, I don't. Uh, I mean, basically, this is that. Uh, uh, so it is monotonically uh, decreasing with respect to the refractive index. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is also monotonically decreasing with respect to the, I mean, the size of the inhomogeneity. Um, so the, if the inhomogeneity becomes smaller and smaller, transmission eigenvalues go to infinity. Uh, but I don't see how probably, I mean, there is, there is in my opinion, uh, it's still open question to get a stable way to determine transmission eigenvalues at high frequency. For that matter, our method at low frequency also might have some stability issues. Some peak may not be very sharp. It's hard to quantify. But, uh, but yeah, I don't know how to, use, uh, how to use this. And since you brought up this question, I would like to mention that uh, the transmission eigenvalues are a nonlinear phenomena because at Born approximation, uh, you don't have transmission mm -hmm. eigenvalues at all. So you could see here, if the inhomogeneity goes to a point source, the transmission mm -hmm. eigenvalue go to infinity. Yeah, my another question is that since you mentioned it, uh, if you use multiple frequencies, will help you a lot. So why we cannot formulate the, uh, the problem in the time domain, which allow you to uh, take care of all frequencies? Okay, so uh, right. So so since you have multi 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 frequency data, you need for this transmission eigenvalues. Um, you you may as well use sort of time domain data, for example, right? So so in that case, the only um, the only way uh, uh, I mean the only method I know in this group of techniques, qualitative methods, is kind of determining the 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 support, the interface. So I don't know, maybe. Fadil knows much more about this, how time domain data, <laughs> no, about the scattering poles in the sense that how time domain data uh, uh, give you information about scattering poles, right? So maybe it's an interesting it's a decay question. rate, I guess, yeah. 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 So it's an interesting question. So if you have time domain data, I mean, how can you, I mean, how can you observe this, uh, this transmission eigenvalues? I would put this problem the same as if you have time domain data and you have a Dirichlet, uh, Dirichlet scatter, okay? Mm. So how Dirichlet eigenvalues are seen in the time domain scattering data? It's the same issue. So how transmission eigenvalues are seen in the time domain uh, scattering data for inhomogeneity? So yeah, uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe in the context of Dirichlet uh, scatters, people have made some connection along these lines, but uh, I don't know. But yeah, it's a good question. Yeah, so how to see those particular transmission of those eigenvalues if you have directly time domain data? Oh, thank you. Very good. Uh, I have a question, uh, Firal. But you see, at the last part of your talk, you were saying you can pre-compute with, uh, yeah, n n lambda. 
how would you choose the uh, the inhomogeneity so that you can next you know how, how would you choose the inhomogeneity uh, for your pre-compute? Uh, right. So so I I mean unfortunately yeah I always have this problem have too many stuff uh, in the talk so. Um, what we have been doing so far. So you have like an absorbing, even dispersive media, because mm -hmm. if you look at fixed frequency, it doesn't really matter, right? So, mm -hmm. so you have this uh, sub, uh, inhomogeneity D. What we have been doing, we have surrounded the inhomogeneity D by a ball, for example, right? So mm -hmm. suppose you have some information uh, about the size, whatever. I mean, some mm -hmm. a priori information. And, and what you uh, uh, compute is, and you put some impedance boundary condition on that ball, for example, right? And one choice would be then you compute the scattering problem due to this ball with impedance boundary condition. Lambda is the impedance, is a constant. Mm -hmm. It's very easy to compute, right? So now, if you look at invisibility for the corresponding operator, so say you compute this for a range of lambdas, then, um, then what comes out is going to be the um, Steklov eigenvalue problem defined on the boundary of this ball with uh, not the Helmholtz equation, but with all kinds of inhomogeneity co coefficient you have inside. So basically you get the eigenvalues of Dirichlet to Neumann operator that way. Mm. Okay, so this has been uh, the very uh, first idea has been explored, we introduced it first here and has been done for Maxwell's equations and uh, has been done uh, for cracks and other things, right? So I didn't have time, but if you have two minutes, I can show you sure. how to apply this idea. So I would like, uh, this came from like aeroplane canopy. You have a piece of glass, very complex structure. You don't have an exact model and you would like to monitor changes, right? Say this. So what do we, you, uh, and I gave here a simple model, asymptotic model, you have the jumps, but doesn't matter, right? So, so what you do, suppose you know the shape of the glass, you just need to monitor changes in the material properties. So you kind of embed this in some very simple shape, okay? And uh, you introduce, you can put this lambda only on gamma, you can put this lambda all the way around. So you have this flexibility, right? So, so now what is the best choice? My view is that it's problem oriented. Mm right? Because also, I mean, whether you pick a lambda for which there is no scattering for that particular structure, also that it's either by luck or you must have some understanding what you are looking for, basically, yeah? to make a, a choice for which range of lambda you pre-compute this. But suppose you are monitoring this glass, this piece of glass, and then you have an idea of the range of parameters and so, but you don't have a precise model sort of you you have an idea even empirically by experiments you have an idea where this could happen right the healthy material right so then you pre-compute all these scattering problems you keep them there and then you get the scattering data and you use these pre-computed scattering problems and you see whether this lambda has changed or not and that lambda that you see involves only the scattering operator modified by these pre-computed uh, problems that do not involve any change. It's just an, an artificial scattering problem. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, uh, the, the examples have that we have produced have been pretty much toy examples. I don't know how uh, a really uh, feasible in the real life is. Mm. People at the at the Air Force uh, non-destructive testing has been excited have been excited about these ideas. I don't know, but we never been able to get. I mean, I don't do the numerics actually for the numerics in this part. Peter Monk has been involved, and Sam actually. Sam has done mm. a lot of stuff in this. Mm. In that lab, pe people got very excited about the about this idea once Sam spoke uh, in the in in the in the interview. Was. Uh... You were doing some some work with uh, Boyan, right? Was, was he doing this kind of computations as well? Uh, no. no, no. With Boyan, uh, with Boyan, we simply did uh, 
transmission eigenvalues for elastic media actually because because he has a lab as well he was doing some yeah. measurements yeah yeah we wanted to determine transmission eigenvalues then or maybe even using linear sampling or sort of more standard qualitative methods yeah yeah he probably could yeah maybe it's a good idea i'll contact him back uh, maybe one can do this for elastic at least try from his experimental data mm, very interesting uh any other questions from the audience uh, well, if not, I guess I want to just thank you again, Fiora, for, for a very nice talk, and we have a lot to think about. <laughs> yeah, I, I apologize, I know it was uh, too dense, but I get sort of, I like, I say, no, I have to include this, I have to include that. To work on That's that. fine. You have to come back for a second round. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you again. Okay, see you, see everyone, and uh, there will be another talk next week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you very much for inviting me and for listening. <laughs>